th there is a freakishly large number of book sales on Freakonomics. But, I mean, seven million is the public figure. I'm sure it's probably a bit more than that in reality. The blog. Why do you assume that it's more? It could be that we lie. Like it was a 2014 figure. So mm. I, I, it could I, be I, that we I inflated it by 100 percent. But you're right. You're right. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can see how this is going to go. <laughs> the blog itself has had about 3 million downloads on each of its episodes, which is pretty impressive. Um, and of course, there is the one thing which, for all of us Googlers who are looking for things to do once we leave Google, uh, we think about careers to do. And so Stephen is going to talk to us about robbing banks today, I think. Uh. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it, is, it is true that um, I, ap I apologize for being late, but it is entirely your queen's fault. Um, the, book, the book is called When to Rob a Bank, uh, which is almost entirely random. So um, if you really want to know more about how to do that, I can tell you. Um, although the short answer is don't. The ROI in bank robbery is terrible. That's what that's really all about. It's actually a story of how the book came to be called what it came to be called. So if we want to get into that later in Q&A, we can, which is how little leverage authors exert with their publishers, even when they've sold a few copies of a book, because that was our third or fourth title. Uh, the first few got rejected. So anyway, uh, there is a book called When to Rob a Bank. It is a book that is a compilation of the best, the greatest hits of our blog from 10 years. So we wrote, a, we published about, by now about 8,500 blog posts over the course of 10 years, uh, most of which were terrible, uh, either in the moment or um, beyond, you know, they just didn't last. But we went through and we found about 500 that we actually still enjoyed reading, then we whittled that down to 132, and that's, so that's what's in the book. So I can talk, you know, I, I'm gonna talk for a while, then I'll, I'll take questions, because I know every time I speak at a Google event, there are a lot of questions which I really enjoy, so I'm not gonna talk too long right now. But the occasion of the book um, was the 10-year anniversary of the publication of our first book, Freakonomics. So this is our fourth book, and for 10 years I've been working together with Steve Levitt, who's an economist at the University of Chicago, and we've been doing you know, this project together that's had many different forms. The first couple books were largely, but not exclusively, based on academic research he'd done. Our third book was called Think Like a Freak, which was kind of using everything we'd learned from not only methodology, but from getting out in the real world to work with firms and governments to try to solve problems, because after the first couple books, we were called in by people who thought we'd be useful in that way. Often, m almost always we weren't, um, but we kind of set out a, a blueprint for problem solving, essentially. And then this fourth book, which as I said, is a compilation of blog posts marking 10 years of us doing our thing together. So it is inherently um, a time uh, of a retrospective time, as all anniversaries are. and um, because we've been doing it a long time, you start to think, or I've started to think a little bit, bit about legacy and what it means to you know, do anything for that long a time and what kind of mark, if any, one leaves. And so I wanted to share with you one, uh, I think the perfect illustration of the legacy of Freakonomics as gleaned last night. Uh, when I was here in London, I was doing media all day yesterday. It started about 8 a.m and it went till about 11.30 p.m., right? And the last stop was uh, the 500th BBC visit of the day, and it was Newsnight. So does anybody watch Newsnight? I assume not, really. It's a, <laughs> right? uh, so I'm in the green room at Newsnight, which is the room where they put the, the guests before they go on. And there were a couple of um, MPs, male um, MPs, who one conservative, one liberal, or whatever you call them, uh, labor, and uh, <laughs> and they were um, and they were just chatting uh, ami very amiably with each other, and then they got ushered in to the set to go do their piece, and then uh, someone else came in, uh, and this was a woman who was also an MP, and she's standing now for the head of the Labor Party. So uh, I, I probably shouldn't name her because of. Um, <laughs> what I'm about to tell you about what she said, although it's not that bad. And I understand there are three women running, so you, you'd have to actually go back and watch last night's show to narrow it down. So I'm not gonna do that work for you. But one of the three women who are standing for um, labor um, head, she, um, she's very, she's, you know, you could tell right away she's a great politician because she looks at us and she wants to know who we are, what we're doing, very friendly, chatty, sticking out her hand to shake. She has her, her bike helmet 
uh, which I'm sure she brought along with her in the taxi to look good. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> And she says, um, what, are you, you know, what are you in for? That's what they always ask you when you're in a green room. And I always say homicide, because that's what they ask in my country when they say, what are you in jail for? So then, then she said, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, I'm an author. I'm going to talk about the book. She said, what books? And I said, the, uh, I, write, I write the Freakonomics books. And she said, oh, oh. And she starts nodding. And she said, yeah, I, I loved, I remember reading Freakonomics. She said, that was the book with the ridiculous names like shithead that's pronounced shateed, right? And I said, yeah, yeah. And this is what the MP who's running for head of labor remembers about the book, right? She says, oh yeah, shithead. I loved shithead. That was fantastic. So it's not about you know, any of the public policy stuff. It's not about the relationship of abortion and crime. It's not about drug dealing. It's not about anything. It's shithead. And then furthermore, she says, yeah, I really loved how you wrote that when parents give their kids these ridiculous names, they ruin their lives for them. And what I wanted to say, what I always want to say in that situation but never do, is that actually you've got that exactly wrong. The argument we made using the data on naming and parents' education and the outcome of children and so on was that the name that you give your child doesn't matter at all. All the name is is an indicator of who the parents are. But if your parents A and you have a, a boy named James or parents B and you're observationally equivalent to parents A and you name your boy Shithead or Shateed, Shithead and James are not going to have any substantially different outcome in their life. That's what the data showed and yet most people who read this and remember it remember it exactly wrong. So she remembered, so the two things that the potential head of Labor Party remembers about our legacy is Shithead and she got it wrong. So that's <laughs> That's my legacy. That's um, what I'm. Um, that's <laughs> what I'll be remembered for, if anything. And I guess it's um, it's deserving because um, uh, uh, let me tell you, you know, how I spend my day. So I know you, you all, mostly engineers. All engin anybody here not an engineer? Anybody sneak in? Where'd you sneak in from? Yeah. Are you in the building? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not even in this building. Mm. I'm in our sales office, but uh, yeah, I'm actually sneaking. Back okay. That's why you have such better glasses than the engineers. <laughs> there were a couple other, are you the, yeah, you, 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 it's so easy to pick out the non-engineers, I have to say. I think it's the same building, I work in marketing. Okay, and there was one more? Yeah. I work in editorial. Mm-hmm. Okay, so a good um, half a percent smattering of sales, marketing, and editorial along with engineers. Okay, so I know how you all spend your day generally. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't survive doing what you do for half a day. I have, I have no idea how to do what you do, but I generally understand what it is you do. Um, so let me just tell you briefly how I spend my day. Um, I live in New York on the Upper West Side. I have a nice family. I've got a wife, I've got two kids, got a little dog. And my office, um, which is another apartment um, near uh, where we live, it's about two blocks away. So in the morning, I, I get up, I have some coffee, read some papers, say goodbye to the kids, and I, and I go to my office at about 7.30 a.m. And I usually walk the dog along the park, which is very nice. And then once I start my day, all I'm doing is like I'm walking with the dog, looking at the park, and I'm thinking about stuff. I'm looking at people, I'm looking at you know the people interacting on the street and their cars and bikes and pedestrians and wondering why more people aren't killed on that intersection because it seems to be a very dangerous one. Um, I'm looking at, you know, weather, how people respond to it, just thinking about the way people live their lives and how they make their decisions, stuff like that. Then um, I get to my office, give the dog some food, and then I just sit and basically all day long I just keep doing that. I sit and think and I read and I write and it's entirely inconsequential. Uh, and, and, and that's how I spend my day. So for instance, um, I like economics a lot, not I never really liked the form of economics we study in university so much. It felt, for me, at least overly mathematical, um, not that interesting, not that useful. It sounded like the brightest people among the professional uh, economists were divided on the most important issues of the day. In other words, we looked to them to describe the economy, to actually tell us how the macro economy really works. And it turns out that they're wrong more often than they're right, and that the best and brightest argue with each other constantly about um, the most essential facts of that. So I never really liked that kind of economics, but I like, you know, the weirder kind of economics, um, including that that my partner Steve Levitt has worked on for years. Um, I like agricultural economics, for instance. Get some of those journals. Like to read those. I grew up on a little farm in upstate New York, and you know, food is one of those things that I marvel at every day. You know. Uh, a century ago, 
it was thought as we had you know roughly a billion people on Earth, it was thought that there's no way we could support two billion. You know, there's no way we can grow that much food for two billion people. And then after that, it was no way we can get to three or five billion. Here we are at seven billion, more than enough food for everybody. A lot of people still don't get enough food, but that's almost entirely because of political or economic failures, not because of ag agricultural failures. So agricultural economics to me are really interesting. How do we get so good at this, right? It's not just economics, obviously, but the way that it's sourced, the way that it's resourced, the way it's distributed, the way when it goes wrong, like in California right now, what's going on with the water prices is, or with the water shortage is plainly a product of water being badly, badly, badly mispriced for many years in California. Um, so agricultural economics are kind of fun for me. Like, I wonder why is it that living in New York, I can buy a kiwi fruit and a banana for less than it costs me to buy one apple, which is grown often in New York, whereas the kiwi fruit is grown in New Zealand, the banana is grown somewhere in Latin America. Why is that? So those parts of economics and agriculture I like. And one day I was reading this journal and I just saw a simple um, fact. It was nothing but one simple fact. And I, I'm curious whether you guys, when you run across this kind of simple fact, if it triggers the same kind of thought process, I'm guessing it does. The fact I saw in a journal said that of the turkeys that are bred for consumption in the United States, um, that uh, roughly 100% of them, <coughs> of those birds, are the result of artificial insemination. So I thought, well, first of all, weird. Uh, and I'd never in my life thought about turkey sex at all. I, I, I did grow up on a farm, we didn't have turkeys, we had chickens, we had some other animals. I'd never thought about turkey sex, so I see this fact and I think, that's odd. Like, and then you immediately start to think, well, who's doing that and how is it done, okay? But then I wanted to know why, you know, what does it mean? Does it represent anything interesting worth knowing? So whenever you see a fact, or whenever I see a fact, the next instinct is then to surround it or attack it with data that you can put it in context and see, you know, what it means. Is it a blip? Is it part of a trend or whatnot? So of course then you go to the data on chicken sex. You want to see, you know, turkeys and chickens are pretty similar when they're raised for consumption. If turkeys are 100% bred artificially, I assume chickens are too, then you go to the chicken data and it turns out that's not the case at all. So it turns out that most chickens breed naturally as God intended, right? But turkeys don't. So why is that? They're relatively similar. So then I went looking for other fowl data, and there just wasn't that much. We, d we don't really eat enough other fowl in the States to have a whole lot of data. So it was really tur turkeys and chickens, and they were really different. So then I wanted to know more. So then you go try to find some other data, then you try to find people who know why things are the way they are, and that's you know what you do. You get on the phone, you start writing emails. So here's, <laughs> here's what um, the story turned out to be. Um, in the States particularly, but also here and in other countries where, where there's a lot of turkey. So first of all, turkey consumption has risen a lot in the last 40 or 50 years. Now, uh, turkey plus poultry uh, plus chicken consumption almost equals red meat consumption, which is a big, big change from the old days. And as Americans began to eat more and more turkey, uh, it became very evident that the preference, the, the primary preference, preference was for breast meat, okay? People like white meat of turkeys. Now, I'm, I don't, I'm a dark meat person. I, my personal thought is that people don't really like the white meat that much, but it's a better delivery system for gravy and for mayonnaise. But anyway, they want the white meat. Okay, so how did that change things? Well, breeders began to grow, to breed turkeys with larger breasts, okay? So if you look back at the turkeys that were bred for consumption 50 years ago in the States, they had a very, very, very scrawny breast and kind of big hindquarters. They were kind of like wild turkeys. They bred them to have larger and larger breasts over time, okay? So now the male and female turkeys are both bred to have larger and larger breasts. So you can imagine in the old days, the turkey like scrawny little chest, but now they're growing and growing and growing and growing like this. So now they get to the point where the turkeys now that are bred for consumption have such large breasts that when they try to, when they meet in the barnyard or whether they meet and they try to get close enough to have sex, they can't get close enough to physically have sex, thus the need for an entirely new industry, which is turkey masturbation and artificial insemination. <laughs> this is how I spend my days. So then I wrote a piece about this. I wrote a piece about this. I thought it was pretty interesting. I, I, I maintain it's very interesting. And it's so interesting to me, the things, you try to think through every kind of you try to surround an issue or surround a problem and consider all the possible data, all the possible explanations, 
And then you write it or you put it out there. And I'm sure this happens with you guys with coding as well. You try to think about all the possible avenues where it can go, but also how it can be responded to once the public gets hold of it. So some, one thing that happened with that story afterwards that I never could have anticipated was that um, there was a small but very, very, very vocal um, group of people who just railed against this story on the grounds that we were glorifying turkey rape. And they said that you can say, you can call it artificial insemination, but what it really is is removing the rights of living creatures to naturally procreate and you're raping them in order to make more of them to eat them. So when you put it like that, it does sound pretty bad. Honestly, it was something I hadn't thought about. I did eat less turkey for a month or so as a result of that, but I've since resumed. So like I said, this is what I spend my day. So it's kind of fitting that my legacy from the MP is shithead and that she got the, um, the notion of the way the names move exactly wrong. Uh, I'll give you another example of how I spend my day. Um, okay, education. Uh, I'm guessing that the median uh, level of education here is somewhere between M and PhD. Yeah, maybe, yeah, okay. So you guys have way, you know, many, 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 many years of education under your belts. Um, if you were to look at every form of investment known to humankind, um, it's hard to make this argument definitively, but I would argue that the single best investment ever in history is education, right? So if you had one hour or one dollar or one brain cell to spend on something, if your primary concern is ROI that's scalable, um, education is the best investment. So the data for that are pretty overwhelming. One of the things that's most, um, if you didn't know it, I think it would be surprising if, if you didn't know it, which is that the higher you go up the scale, the greater the ROI is, right? So it's kind of the opposite of diminishing returns. You guys with PhDs and, and M degrees um, you know, earn a lot more than those with B degrees, which um, diminishing returns would kind of um, argue against. So um, we know that and it's great. And it's the reason that so much of our public policy tries to encourage people who are in position to set up education systems to get their kids educated and so on, why we urge them to do that is because it is like, it's not only the best insurance, it's um, investment, it's the best insurance. I mean, if you wanna insure against criminal behavior, against um, poor health behaviors, against risky behaviors, education is you know, a phenomenally leveraged unit. So when, when we know that, and I did a bunch of work on um, kind of, you know, in, in, in the past recent years with the recession, there were a lot of people coming out of college with degrees, with good degrees, not, not able to find a job. So that began this big debate in the States, and I assume here as well, that, oh, maybe it's not worth it. You know, what's the opportunity cost? Maybe it's way too high. You know, um, Steve Jobs didn't finish college, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, da 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 can find a handful of really famous dropouts to say maybe, maybe it's a really bad idea. So we did a pretty you know, multifaceted analysis of the, the cost of education and the payoff of education for college. And we came to the same conclusion that all the other scholars had, which is it's still really good. So then whenever you have something that's really valuable, um, in this case it's expensive and valuable, those two don't always go together, um, you also wonder, well, are there people who want to get the value part without paying the cost? Are there people who are going to try to cheat or try to steal? So this became a really interesting question in part because it's really hard to figure out. So whenever you're trying to learn about illicit behavior, um, you know, drug dealing, prostitution, all the regular kind of crimes, embezzlement, bank robbery, and so on, the, the obvious hard part of getting those data is because it's an illicit activity, it's a hidden activity, because it's hidden, the data are hard to get. So one thing that we've spent a lot of time doing the past bunch of years is um, finding ways to get data from those realms of illicit behavior. So there's this amazing fellow named Sudhir Venkatesh. That some of you may remember his name from Freakonomics, although if the MP remembered only shithead, I'm, I'm <laughs> doubting you're going to remember Sudhir Venkatesh's name. But he's an amazing guy who's a sociologist who at the University of Chicago showed up and ultimately ended up embedding himself in a crack gang and kind of lived with this gang for five or six years. And, and among the trophies he walked away with, was a set of financial records from the gang. 
So they weren't quite, you know, KPMG audit quality um, financial records, but they were pretty good. And from those data, we're, we were able to write about the economics of the crack gang. Until you have that data, you're guessing. When you watch movies about drug gangs, they're based usually on one person's story that's usually exaggerated and magnified and, and distorted in many ways. So to try to get data like that is, getting data like that is really valuable. Um, similarly, with Sudir, uh, we did a project a few years later on street prostitution in Chicago. So again, if you're trying to ask a very basic question like why do people do prostitution? Is it because they actually have no choice whatsoever and they're driven there by um, desperation? Um, how well does it pay? What are the risks of arrest, of violence, of disease, and so on? But until you can get some data, you can't answer these questions. So again, in this case, we went out and solicited data, set up a bunch of um, basically grad students with clipboards to sit with prostitutes before and after every trick and fill out a, a survey. Um, and survey data is often very squishy, as I'm sure you all know. But in this case, uh, it worked out pretty well. We could verify that the, the data was pretty good. And so from that, we were able to learn a lot of things about the cost of different sex acts. We were able to learn what kind of premium a prostitute would demand for not for having the John not use a condom. We were able to look at the interaction between law enforcement and prostitution, which illustrates uh, really beautifully what's known as the principal agent problem. You guys know the principal agent problem? Most of you, some know. Principal agent problem is, um, again, keep in mind, I'm not an economist. So everything I say about eco economics, you should check the textbook afterwards. But um, uh, the principal agent um, notion in economics argues that when there are two parties, let's say, a principal and an agent, who would seem to have their incentives aligned, um, it's often the case that they're not aligned for reasons that I'll explain right now. So let's say in a police department, you would think everybody in the police department wants to arrest people who are doing crimes, right? That's kind of their mission. But let's say that uh, the mayor of police tells the chief of police in Chicago, sorry, the, let's say the mayor of Chicago tells the chief of police in Chicago, you know what, we're bidding on the Olympics and we really want to clean up the streets and we need to wipe out the most obvious prostitution. Okay, so let's make it a mission to um, get rid of the most obvious street prostitution. So then the, what happens, the chief of police tells the cops on the street, you know what, let's go arrest a bunch of prostitutes for a few months and just tell them that they have to you know, get off the street for a year or so or maybe take it inside or whatever. So it would seem to be that's an alignment of incentives. Everybody's getting paid to do the job, which in this case is to get um, prostitutes off the street. But the way the real world works, you often have a principal agent dilemma, which is that the principal has a clear goal and the agent who's supposed to be carrying out the principal's wishes seems to have the clear goal, but then personal incentives come into play because they're like the personal incentives and the public incentives or the official incentives. So as it turns out, from the data, what we learned about this particular case of the principal agent problem was that a given prostitute in Chicago was more likely to have sex with a cop for free than to be arrested by one. In other words, the cops found it much more to their liking not to arrest the prostitutes and actually to take advantage of them the way that the customers did, except because they had the leverage for free. So those are the kind of um, findings, if you want to call them that, that you just can't get without data. So we work to get those data. And when it comes to education and college diplomas and college degrees, we were interested to know, since they're so valuable and so expensive, um, how many people cheat? How many people steal them in some way, right? There are a lot of different ways to, to cheat to get a, a college degree or diploma. So we began looking into it and it's turned out to be really hard to get any kind of first-hand data. The best we could do, however, was an FBI agent who had um, who had spent years doing this, looking into it, and he was really good. Plus, it helps when you're with the FBI. You can you can go to the people who have the data and demand that they give you the data, which which you and I can't necessarily do. And what was really interesting about this guy is he, like a lot of the the people that we write about, a lot of the people that I consider kind of heroes for the way that they try to solve problems. He was motivated by, he was driven by a personal interest. And in, in his case, this was a guy who, you know, was an FBI salaried worker, so he's not making a ton of money, and he had two daughters getting ready to go to college. He lived in North Carolina. 
And he realized that even if he sent them to, to very good state colleges, like University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, that it was going to cost, I don't know, maybe sixty dollars to $80,000 if you add in everything, maybe $100,000 for the two daughters to get their college degree. <laughs> and the human in him, not the FBI agent in him, the human in him was just thinking, that's a lot of money. I, I wish I could just buy them a fake diploma and buy them a fake degree, and I would pay five or $10,000 for that happily if it was good enough to kind of convince everybody that needed convincing. So obviously that's not what we think of as education. That's what we think of just as the outcome of the education. But if you think about it, when you show up to apply for a job, they don't really ask you, except maybe at Google, like what you studied in philosophy. They just want to, they just want to know that you have the, and nobody even ever asks for the degree. So he thought, you know, if I'm willing to pay that money for fake diplomas for my daughters, and I'm an FBI agent, presumably there are some other people out there who would be willing to do it. So we began to ex explore the world of diploma mills and counterfeit shops. So it turns out there are a, a lot of different kinds of ways to get a fake diploma or to make a fake diploma and to market it. And the two basic ones are diploma mills, which would be basically like you could take a, a, a correspondence course in like golf course maintenance from some university and you could then parlay that one correspondence course into a bachelor's degree for an extra five hundred or thousand dollars okay and then there are so that's the diploma mill form and then there are counterfeit shops where they can just basically print very 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 good diplomas and um, the market being what it is the price variance is huge but for like about five or six thousand dollars you could get a, a beautiful, um, indistinguishably inauthentic medical degree from Harvard for about five or six thousand dollars. Okay, so when this agent began to gather these data, arrest these people, find their sources, find their customers, began to measure the customers against the actual number of college graduates, it turned out that approximately one percent of all college degrees awarded in the United States every year were totally fake. So 1%, so you think, well, 1% of anything, not necessarily that much, except when it's 1% of a, a big number like that, for whom this credential is supposed to be kind of life-altering, and for which you're supposed to have spent four to eight years and you know, maybe $100,000 on, it's pretty significant. So um, the bottom line of that statistic is, um, if, you, if you work with, let's say, 100 people, and how many people are in this room today, would you say, Will? <laughs> So I won't point any fingers, but if you look around, the odds are that someone here is totally piping it in and that their uh, diploma is entirely fictitious. Now, that doesn't mean that that person is actually going to be a worse employee than the people who went through school for the four years or eight years, but, um, but that's what the data say. So this, this, is, um, this is how I spent my days. It's in some ways, I guess, not that different from yours, and in some ways, fundamentally very different. So uh, I'd love to open it up to questions now and, and see, um, see what, you have to, what, you would, what you'd like to know. Okay, please raise your hand if you have a question and wait for the microphone. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, I think it's fascinating this interaction between the uh, kind of the diplomas and, and the ROI on education that you mentioned. Is the ROI in the bit of paper or in the knowledge that you get? That's, that's the question no one can answer, honestly. Um, I mean, I, if you could come up with a good way to measure that, um, I'd love to know. I mean, there are ways you could imagine measuring it, but no one that I've ever found has actually done that. Um, I mean, it's not hard to imagine that the vast majority of the value lies in actual knowledge and skills acquisition. Um, but there are those who argue that a great part of the value in a college education lies in communicative skills, networking skills, um, and so on. And if you think about the cost of a college education, both in terms of dollars or pounds and in terms of hours, which are very, very, very substantial. I mean, the people who make the argument that a lot, a lot fewer people should go to college are those people who make that argument. And their argument is the opportunity cost is huge. So if you gave every, you know, let's say you take 10 students in the UK and you take from, you know, in terms of academic ability, you take numbers four through seven. Eight through ten, you say they're going to a university. One through three, maybe they're going to trade school or going straight to a job. But let's say we take four through seven, and we have to decide you know, what we're going to do with them or what would be the best outcome for them personally and for society. 
There are those who would argue that if you take the opportunity cost of college is so huge that if you took two years or four years and the amount of dollars that are spent and invested them in that person or that person was able to invest that him or herself in a small business, other training, that could far, far, far increase the output. So basically the, 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 the most nuanced argument that I think is valid is that the way that college is um, pitched to and positioned for all students is pretty poor for all students and that there should be a lot more segmentation than there is. That's, that's the bottom line. So I think you could argue that for a lot of people who go to college expecting the skills and knowledge acquisition to be the thing that makes them more successful, it doesn't happen, absolutely. But um, I don't, we don't know, I, I've never seen great data on that. Even the data, honestly, on uh, the ROI on college are very hard to come by because if you think about it, you know, you can't randomize that. You can't, what you'd want to do is you'd want to take like, you know, 10 cities in the UK and pick a thousand graduating students from those cities and randomize them all, right? And take, and maybe you just do two groups, maybe you do four groups, but you send some to great universities, some just out to get a job and so on, and then you'd measure the effect of the university itself. But we can't do that. So the best studies that have done are kind of these natural experiments. One of them having to do with the military draft during the Vietnam War, when there were a bunch of people who would have gone to college but didn't, and then other observationally equivalent people who did go to college. And from that one study and from some other similar ones, the conclusion has been had that the ROI is gigantic. But even that, you know, it's these, these questions are not um, nearly as foolproof. The answers are not nearly as foolproof as we might wish. Well, maybe if the alternatives are going to college or going to war, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> agree, agree, yeah. Uh, uh, what were your proposed book titles that got rejected? Oh, OK, so I'll tell you. It, it's probably not interesting to anyone but me. And, and Penelope, Penelope, who's with the publisher, might prefer that I not tell the story. But it's, it's not a big deal. So, so titles with us have always been a bit of a thing. So. Our first book, uh, we'd written it, and it was just this heap of unrelated stories about baby names and crack dealing and sumo wrestlers and cheating teachers and nonsense. And, uh, and so it was very hard to think of a title. Uh, we just thought of it as kind of a book about nothing, uh, but it needed, it, that wouldn't work exactly. So we and the publisher were trying to come up with all kinds of things um, that were horrible. One was, It Ain't Necessarily So, which is an old, you know, an, a wonderful old song with a bad title. One was um, E-Ray Vision, like X-Ray Vision, but E for economics, which is really quite, yeah. So, um, <laughs> right, so even when you get it, it's pretty bad. Um, and then Steve Levitt's sister, um, whose name is Linda Gines, um, who had been in publishing and um, ad advertising for a bunch of years, we gave her the manuscript and asked her to come up with names, and she came up with Freakonomics. And uh, it was so, so Levitt, here's what Levitt maintains. Levitt maintains that he loved it initially and I hated it. I maintain that I thought it was so bad that it might be good, but I wasn't quite sure if it was just so bad that it was purely bad. But anyway, we presented it to the publisher, the American publisher, and they dismissed it entirely. Said it's just too weird. Said freak is gonna make people think of sex. It's gonna be weird sexonomics. That can't work. Um, it's too long. It doesn't mean anything. That's what they said. It doesn't mean anything. And I said, have you ever heard of a portmanteau? A word that you actually, you know, people make up word. Make up. They even make up titles. Um, and I, you know, I like. So I made up a word one time. The so um, I think this is the only word. The only good word I've ever made up. You know, you run into someone. Uh, that you used to date and they got married afterwards and you realize you were the last person they dated before they married. So what do you call that person? There should be a word for it, right? Okay, try this. Penultimore. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, so I thought Freakonomics was pretty good. And, uh, and, and it took the publisher, it was right, it was right up to the, the 11th hour of publication. And they finally said, okay, we'll go with Freakonomics. And then the book came out and it did very well and they immediately claimed total credit for having come up with the title. <laughs> so that was Freakonomics. Then we did Super Freakonomics, which was not that controversial, although the publisher, again, was worried that the estate of Rick James was going to come after us, which they did not. And then we did Think Like a Freak. That was actually pretty agreed upon, but this one, so this one was originally called, again, so you, you think about the signal you're trying to send with a title, right? So we, it's interesting. We make the argument that names don't matter, right? But 
the, arg the argument that titles don't matter is much harder to make. And the reason is that a name of a person is really just a, um, it's not marketing in the same way that a, a product title is marketing, right? So if you name something Google or even ESPN, you know, there are people who are gonna hear it repeatedly before they start to use it and learn whether it's any good for them and so on. But name is a little different. Name is like, you hear the name, you meet the person, then you know the person and the name kind of becomes secondary. It doesn't continue to serve a marketing function. So a book title name, you know, seems to be kind of important. Again, it's very hard to tell. There's not a lot of A-B testing in this realm. And for this one, the book title we came up with was uh, drawn from one of the posts that's in this book and it was called Hooray for High Gas Prices. So we like that because we're American and we talk about gas prices all the time. And there was a post about you know, peak oil this, peak oil that, gas prices too high, too low, the gas tax, whatever. There's a lot I could talk about with gas and oil. But th this one post said get high gas taxes are great because what they help do is capture the cost of this activity that otherwise isn't taxed very well, like, like water. When water is free for farmers, of course they're going to use it all and not leave any for downstream. So when gas is cheap, of course people are going to drive a lot and then that causes congestion, accident risk, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And unless you can raise the gas tax, which federal officials in DC won't for a variety of reasons, then um, it, people just drive a lot. So the post was called Hooray for High Gas Prices. So that, the our American publisher said, yeah, great. And then the British publisher, excellent publisher, Penguin, got hold of it and they say, well, gas doesn't mean here what it means there. So it'd have to be Hooray for High Petrol Prices, which doesn't work at all, or it's gonna sound like it's a book of gastroenterology of some kind, okay? <laughs> so then they said, can you come up with a different title for the British edition? And um, so I said, yeah, but we didn't like the idea because it's not fun to have a, you write a book and you don't want it to be called different things in different places. But then we came up with a title that, um, uh, that we absolutely loved, which I thought would be the perfect title for the book, which is called We Were Only Trying to Help. Uh, right? Isn't that, isn't that good? And uh, because a lot of the blog posts in this book are basically where we just kind of run an idea up the flagpole. Maybe it's about paying politicians more. Maybe it's about you know gas prices. Maybe it's about proposing a sex tax, all these different kinds of things, knowing that they're either not fully enactable at all or even a little bit enactable, or just a kind of, just a question to ask to get a different kind of conversation started. Because, you know, my frustration is that politics being what they are, um, institutional inertia being what it is, institutional habits being what they are, it's really, really, really hard to make any real change. I mean, change in most institutions is two degrees this way. When really, if you look at healthcare, education, sometimes you need like 90 degrees or 180 degrees. So a lot of what we do are just proposing these kind of outlandish ideas. One post was Steve Levitt wrote one um, saying that, you know, terrorism is a concern in the US even though incidents are very, very, very rare, but we're spending a lot of money, a lot of mind share on it. So if we're really serious about it, we should try to think of all potential ways that a terrorist could attack. So on the blog, he wrote asking, dear readers, if you were a terrorist, how would you attack? <laughs> which seemed like a really good idea at the time. We were only trying to help. But um, as it turns out, the New York Times, which was then running our blog, immediately panicked and shut down comments and I think called the FBI on us. It was brutal. <laughs> so, um, so we were only trying to help with a title that we proposed to the British publisher. And the immediate response was, yeah, perfect. That's why I love our British publishers so much. And then I said to the American publisher, you know what? We got a better title than we were only trying to help. Then hooray for got high gas prices. We were only trying to help. And our editor said, yeah, that's great. That's awesome. And then like three weeks later, on the same day, I get a call from both publishers because the way it works now in publishing, the editorial team and even the marketing team and the PR team, no offense, they have zero leverage. It's a little bit like probably around here where the engineers have all the juice, right? So in publishing, it's all sales has the juice, right? So the sales team will take a book title and cover out to the bookstores, the chains and Amazon and so on. And they'll say, this is a new book by these guys. And then one person, at the book chain will say, oh, I, don't, I don't like that. That sounds stupid. Or that sounds like they're being you know, self-flagellating or something. So on the same day, I got a call from both publishers said, sorry, we were only trying to help, uh, won't work. So then, then, um, then we just had to go looking for a title and we went looking in the posts of the, that we'd selected for the book. 
And one post that we liked a lot was this one called When to Rob a Bank. And the reason we liked it was because it's not about how to rob a bank, which is kind of procedural. It's not about why to rob a bank, which is kind of obvious. It's about when. And that's the kind of question that we like to ask, which is if you're going to do this, this kind of this thing that turns out to be pretty stupid. So it turns out the, the biggest point of this post is that the ROI in bank robbery is just dreadful. Um, in Britain, you take home about, uh, I think, two and a half or three times the amount of money you get from an average bank robbery in the States, which is interesting. I think it has to do with just more, more cash on hand. But the rate of arrest, the risk of arrest is about the same. So you're likely to get arrested after just three bank robberies. So even if you take home 10,000 pounds, you get arrested after three times. So for 30,000 30, quid, you're going to spend a, a few years in prison. Um, and um, so the ROI is dreadful. If you really want to rob a bank, uh, mornings are much better than afternoons. And yet, the vast majority of bank robbers work in the afternoons, which indicates clearly they haven't looked up the data. Because if they had, they'd be working in the mornings. Or maybe they just can't get up in the mornings. Maybe they're not morning risers, which is probably why they're having to rob banks in the first place. Um, and the very most interesting part of when to rob a bank for me was uh, this was all inspired by the story of a woman in Iowa who was um, embezzling from the bank where she worked. And it turned out to be a bank owned by her father, or run by her father. And um, so if you're going to rob a bank, rob it from inside, right? <laughs> they say the best way to rob a bank is to own one, or at least to work at one. But what was interesting about this woman is she had been working at this bank for many years, 15 or 20 years. And she was finally caught because um, she, she got so burnt out and exhausted that she had to take some time off. And then they discovered that she'd been keeping two sets of books all along. And she'd embezzled, I believe, about $2 million. And this was in the 1960s, so that was a lot. Again, from her father's bank. And as it turns out, the way that she had covered it for all these years was by keeping two sets of books, but by never taking a single vacation day, which is how she got so exhausted that she finally broke down. So after she served her time in prison, her parents took her back. They were very forgiving. And then the FBI or some law enforcement agency said, do you want to come help us catch embezzlers? And one of the things that she introduced them to was the notion of you should, one of the best metrics to identify in looking for embezzlement is um, uh, extraordinary uh, vacation or sick time pay. Because if you're not taking it either when everybody else is taking it or not taking it at all, it's almost certainly because you're doing something with your books that you don't want anybody to see. So that's, um, that's when to rob a bank. Other questions? Yes, please. Oh, you have a mic? Yeah. Um, on the, uh, turkeys and, uh, on the turkey story, the thing I found most astonishing was that the same wasn't true of chickens. Why wasn't the same true of chickens? Um, apparently, so I, short answer, I don't know. If I had to guess, I would say it's one of two things, which is that either as much as we might, uh, okay, so one would be that um, physiologically, even if we want to breed chickens to have as large a breast as possible, that um, <clears throat> their breasts don't get large enough to the point of interference. Two is there is some artificial insemination in chickens. So it could be that there is a segment of chicken breeding where the breasts are protrusive to the point that requires artificial insemination. And I would think that's probably true. Now that you mentioned it, I, that's an obvious question that I should ask and find out because it'd be interesting to know. We did a piece on, um, we did a podcast once called uh, Weird Recycling, which I really liked. It was about um, three different stories about where people took something that was of no value or even negative value and reused it in a way that, that gave it great positive value. So um, uh, maybe we didn't even include horse, man horse manure was one that used to be that. Horse manure in the olden, olden days uh, was uh, worth something. In cities that were growing, they'd have a lot of horse manure. In the cities, they'd sell it to farmers. But then there was horse manure glut as cities grew. So London and New York were paralyzed by horse manure because of the economic glut. There was so much of it that they couldn't sell it. But then the car came along. There are many fewer horses. And now horse manure is quite expensive. So that's a case where, you know. The other instances there were, um, oh, spent nuclear fuel. So there are some nuclear engineers who figured out how to make nuclear power by using what we call spent fuel. Um, and then one example was chicken feet, or what they call in the industry chicken paws. So in the States, almost nobody eats the feet of chicken. Do you, do, you, do you eat them here at all? So if you go to certain Chinese restaurants, and they are very, they look kind of like this, like really clawy, and there's that, that one spur that's right here. They look very much like a human hand that was tortured, uh, a little bit smaller. And, um, and they're definitely an acquired taste. If I mean, I, 
I guess they're acquired tastes, and, and very few people in the States eat them, and obviously here, but in China, they're huge. So it used to be that um, chicken producing firms in the US would throw away billions of chicken feet every year um, at great cost, and then as they began to do more global business, it turns out that they would sell a whole lot to Asia, and, and now big chicken producing companies like Purdue tell me they said that they would not be profitable were it not for the sale of chicken paws, that that's how close the margins are and, and where, where chicken paws put them over the top. That said, in the States, and here, the taste is plainly for the white meat of chicken as well. So I'm guessing that what you would see is that there are some, some, um, some chickens that are bred for that, and, um, and that among those there might be artificial insemination, but I, I don't know enough about bird reproductive. Um, I should now, that, yes, but uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Yes, anyone else? Oh, could you pass the mic? <laughs> Hi, um, so why are politicians so resistant to evidence-based policy making? Why are they so resistant to what? Uh, Evidence-based policy. Oh. Well, before I uh, join with you in accusing them, let me defend them for a minute. Um, why is everybody averse to evidence-based decision-making? I mean, um, I'll just give you two very quick parallels. In medicine, for instance, you know, ha okay, I'm just gonna guess here. A bunch of people sitting here, Google engineers, I'm guessing probably at least 5% of you have a parent who's a, a doctor, a P, uh, an MD. Raise your hand if you have a parent who's an MD. Yeah, okay, that's about right. So, um, so medicine is fascinating, you know, it's, um, there's so much to be grateful for and thankful for, but it's also very, very frustrating because even though there's a lot of science in it, most doctors aren't remotely scientific. And, um, and it turns out that most doctors are also terrible with data. That they're unbelievably bad with the most basic sets of probabilities. Many doctors are at least. And then when they communicate it to their patients, it gets even worse because it becomes a game of telephone. Whereas, you know, you have an, a 2% a, a chance of, you know, of, some, of within 10 years developing a potentially fatal condition. And people, you know, many people hear that in many different ways, but a lot of people hear it in a way that nobody who knows any statistics would ever embrace. So, um, so doctors, I always grew up thinking were scientific in the way that we think of scientific, meaning the scientific method and things are kind of tried and proven, there are hypotheses, there's data gathered and so on. And it turns out that most medicine isn't really built that way. And the only medicine that's really built that way is, are, these days is pharmaceuticals, and some forms of medical interventions, actual treatments. But uh, the vast majority of it is not what you would really call evidence-based. Um, and that's a pretty scary thought at the end of the day. And so we've done stories recently on our podcast, again, where even when there are evidence-based proofs of sorts of treatment or um, in the realm of medical uh, healthcare delivery that's known to be um, efficient, even then policymakers aren't crazy about adopting it. So there's this one um, case we, we did a podcast about in Camden, New Jersey, that's a very, very labor intensive, cost intensive intervention where it turns out that in this area, but in many geographical areas, roughly 5% of the medical patients are responsible for consuming about 50% of all healthcare costs, or of all healthcare. So it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge problem. You've got, just got, um, Massive concentration among people who are going to the emergency room a hundred times a year, right? Just consuming all kinds of costs. So these people came up with, an, they thought, what if we, instead of treating things the way we are now, which is terribly, what if we come up with a new plan to invent a kind of social services multifaceted network where we offer medical care, but we also offer counseling so that people actually understand what drugs are supposed to take and when. So we actually help them get to the doctors they're supposed to go to. So if they need to go to drug rehab, they're doing that and so on. So an expensive hands-on project that ended up being very effective and very cost effective considering what it saved. So even after this kind of thing is proven, no one in federal government associated with Medicare or Medicaid, I'm told, really wanted to have anything to do with it because the constituencies are just so large and ingrained that they really couldn't make any persuasion. So in healthcare, Evidence-based medicine is still kind of more of a dream in education. 
uh, evidence-based um, curricula are only beginning to kind of come online. So for politicians, I would argue, yeah, they're particularly visible in the way that they fail to embrace evidence, but I don't think they're, they're unique at all. Um, and why they don't do it is because, I mean, I think that most politicians, unfortunately, um, I mean, it's kind of a principal agent problem in a way in that they're the, they're the agents and we're the principal. So we're the voters. We want problems solved that we think government is best suited to solve. And these are typically kind of long-term complex scenarios with a lot of different players. Transportation, healthcare, education, things like this, geopolitics that individuals can't do, that businesses don't, private firms don't necessarily do that well. So we think, well, this is what governments are going to do, and that's what we want our politicians to do. And that's what we elect them for. But then once they get in office, the, the way the system is set up, in democracies at least, is that they're kind of encouraged to respond to different incentives, which is short-term self-interested incentives of getting elected, raising money, consolidating power, getting on the right committee, consolidating more power, raising more money in order to perpetuate their own. So even though we don't like, we hate that, we all hate that, but for me, it's hard to blame them for it because that's the set of incentives that they walked into. Um, there are a few maybe idealistic people who buck it, but very few people's ideology is really as strong as the incentives that they're responding to. So one solution to this that we've proposed, I think, in this book, and when to rob a bank, and I've talked about this with many politicians, and they always, they always nod and smile. They say, oh, yeah, that great, great, great idea. Then, but at the end of the day, they hate it, because I'll tell you, because it's totally impossible. The idea would be, A, we should probably pay, we should try at least, we should experiment with paying politicians a lot more. So it'd be really fun to take, how, how many um, parliamentary districts are there in the UK? 625? So it'd be really fun to take that divided in two or four, randomize, and raise the, what's an MP get paid? 100, 100,000 a year or something? Oh, really? 70,000 pounds? Okay. So 100. $100,000, 70,000 pounds, we'll say, it'd be really fun to take and experiment. So for five years, in two districts we leave it, in one district we have it, and one, in one, in one set of districts rather we do this, and one set of districts we double it. All you're really looking for initially is does it attract, do higher salaries attract a different kind of person to go into politics? So some empirical work that's been done on this already answers yes. So in some place in South America, I believe in Mexico, uh, in Singapore, they pay politicians a lot. So there's a lot of things that some people don't like about Singapore. Most political observers, however, argue that it's easily one of the most efficient, uncorrupted, and practical federal governments out there. One reason being, not all, uh, being that they, they make the job incredibly attractive. So rather than maybe coming to Google for a career, the same person might actually want to go into, into council election or a parliamentary election. So that's one, is you could explore the idea of changing the status of political jobs, just the way we explore changing the status of teachers, which we haven't done yet either, by the way. But that's one idea. But then here's a, the bigger, bolder one that will never, ever, ever happen, but what I think could really, really work. If the problem is as I described, if the problem is as I described, which is that their incentives are not aligned with ours, because they have short-term self-interested ones, we have long-term public-interested ones. Well, what if we try to align them better? And one way to align them better would be to remunerate them based on their achievements, merit-based pay, right? So right now, if you think about it, how does a politician build up capital or build up value in their careers? By being more visible, by being usually safe, right? So that they're gonna turn their political career into a, a lobbying or consulting career or maybe it, whatever afterwards. Um, but what we really want them to do is be working on those transportation and education and healthcare problems that we sent them to do. So what if we were to pay them for doing those problems and pay them a lot? So let's say that there's a Department of Education and we decide that, uh, I saw that you're, you're uh, British math students, you're even worse than American, you're terrible, right? Where do you find engineers in this country? Um, right, because you're math, yeah. So your math scores, uh, okay, so let's say that the goal for the next 20 years is for British uh, school math scores to rise 15% or 10% against you know, international averages, whatever. Make so we, <laughs> okay, well, yeah, that, that, that's, a good, so that's a very good political solution, certainly. Um, so, so, okay, immediately I know you would be an excellent politician because you would have a, a very cheap, effective solution right out of the gate. So let's say that that's your goal 
Then let's set up a project to try to figure out how to get to that goal with measurables all along the way. And you declare somebody the arbiter of these goals and the measurables. So maybe it's an accounting firm, whoever. You know, we, know, we know how to do that. We know how to set up projects with measurables. And let's say that you've got a secretary of education and 100 people working on this project who do all kinds of experimentation, who put into um, effect all kinds of curricula, changes, blah, 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 blah. And then let's say 20 years from now, those goals are met, right? So if you raise the test scores of British school children by 15% in 10 or 20 years, whatever, what's that worth to society? A lot, a lot. It's worth a lot to individuals too. And so what would be wrong with therefore paying the people who worked on that in politics to make it happen a share of that? So I'd love to write a check for a million pounds or two million pounds to the Secretary of Education as a kind of vested stock option 10 or 20 years from now if their plan worked out. So basically it's merit pay in the form of stock options for elected and appointed um, political officials, which I think is a no-brainer. I think it works, because that's the way the whole world works, right? If you do well, you get rewarded. If you do poorly, you're gone. The other thing I think is really important to do in, in politics um, is I would steal from uh, football, I would relegate. So every year I would relegate like the bottom 15% of all politicians in every political system just to flush them out the bottom. So, um, <clears throat> so that's how I would fix politics, but as you, as you can imagine, um, we were only trying to help, you know. <laughs> okay. Are we out of time? We're out of time. Okay. Thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate it.